Of the many film adaptations of the works of Shakespeare, Kenneth Branagh's 1996 version of Hamlet perhaps stands out as one of the few that leaves the Bard's script completely unedited. And the result is a four-hour runtime. As much as his fans love his beautiful words, it usually just isn't practical to do any production, stage or film, that doesn't cut something. So the decision, not whether to cut, but what to cut, is always going to be a major artistic decision on behalf of the production team. And sometimes, those decisions may disappoint us. So in this video, we'll count down the top five deleted scenes from Shakespeare films that I believe should have made the final cut. From Hamlet to Romeo and Juliet, these are the scenes that should have made the film adaptation. But first, if you're a fan of Shakespeare, or of the performing arts in general, please consider liking this video, subscribing to my channel, and hitting that notification bell so you don't miss any other content, analyzing great theatrical works, and sharing some of my own. Starting with number five. To show the contrast with the aforementioned uncut Hamlet, let's go to the opposite extreme with Laurence Olivier's 1948 Oscar-winning adaptation, which cuts around half the dialogue, including the entire Fortinbras subplot. Now, here's where I, as a playwright, can understand that dilemma that we writers always face, and often refer to as killing your kittens, where you just have to make some cuts of certain scenes that Although you love them like your babies, they've just got to go. They're great scenes, they just don't belong. And Hamlet may be the best example out there of this principle. It's certainly not because Shakespeare's Fortinbras scenes aren't great. It's just that beyond showing us a decisive leader to contrast with Hamlet's inability to act, it just takes us out of the main plot that the audience has paid to see for too long. While Hamlet's Act IV soliloquy, reflecting on this contrast, is great, and it's a brilliant monologue choice for acting workshops, nearly every production cuts it, and it's hard to argue with that decision. So what is the kitten here that Olivier killed that I really would have liked him to have spared? It's gotta be the Act II prose monologue. Noble in reason. Now, Hamlet may be delivering this to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two other characters whose decision to cut completely may not have been that bad a decision, but with the numerous creative edits that Olivier managed to do throughout this adaptation, I'm sure he could easily have found a way to have worked that in to have had Horatio be the one that Gertrude sends to spy on him and to whom he ends up speaking this great monologue. Not only is it a brilliant poetic statement of the character's humanistic worldview, but also that of the author, and of the age that he spoke for. Having taught history for 21 years, I'm aware of this, as the book my 10th graders used for years quoted this speech in their chapter on the Renaissance as a way of introducing students to the Renaissance vocabulary term of humanism. This speech stands out as the perfect illustration of how one of the main reasons for Shakespeare's greatness is that he was the quintessential Renaissance man. It's a kitten that should have been spared. Coming in at number four on the list, we have another Olivier adaptation, his 1965 adaptation of Othello. Now, Besides the obvious criticisms we can make in the 21st century of how completely inappropriate and racist it is to cast a white actor in blackface, or the fact that as great an actor as Olivier was, his performance here pales in comparison to Lawrence Fishburne's truly amazing performance in the 90s adaptation, or the fact that Olivier's insistence on playing the role doesn't even make sense when you consider that Iago is arguably just as good a role, there is the extremely poor choice of what they cut. 
Here, in sharp contrast with Olivier's work 17 years earlier, this adaptation can be said to have left too much in that could easily have been cut. The aforementioned 1995 version with Lawrence Fishburne has been criticized by many for cutting too much. I happen to think that this version made very good choices about where the play starts to drag and what to cut. I consider it a criminally underrated masterpiece and one of the best Shakespearean film adaptations out there. In contrast, the Olivier version tends to drag because it leaves most of the speeches in. And yet, the one big speech they decided to cut was Iago's How am I then offended to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directed to his good? Divinity of hell. This is a great monologue. We're all so familiar with the I hate the more monologue, but it's this one, in my opinion, that is Iago's best speech. It's a kitten that should have been spared. Moving right along to number three on our list, we have the Hollow Crown's first chapter of Richard II, with its decision to cut the second scene between John of Gaunt and the Duchess of Gloucester, the widow to another one of the many sons of Edward III, whose murder led to the conflict between Bolingbroke and Mowbray that sets the conflict in action in the very first scene. Richard II is the Bard's quintessential look into all the logical arguments, contradictions, and potential logical fallacies about the medieval notion of the divine right of kings, and another potentially powerful resource to teach students history as well as English literature. I especially like the way that the Duke of York's character shows this irony in the way that he is consistent in maintaining that you must be loyal to the king God has anointed, but whom that individual is that deserves such loyalty changes depending on who is winning a civil war. First, he tongue-lashes Bolingbroke for being a traitor for rebelling, but then after the rebellion is over and he and the rebels have won, now he is God's anointed, and to be against him is to be against God. But it's that earlier scene that really helps to illustrate the other side of the coin, a point that people often misunderstand about the divine right theory. As I used to explain to my 10th graders, the theory didn't say that the king should be treated like he was God, but that he was just standing in for him temporarily, and that he too would answer to him someday. The analogy that I told them to think about was, I'll let the Tanner sisters explain it. Dad, Dad! <laughs> but Dad's not here. I'm in charge. That makes me Dad. Until the real Dad comes back and makes you grounded. <laughs> so, that's why this one short scene is so critical to getting into the play's central theme that it analyzes so well. It's a kitten that should have been spared. Next on the list, at number two, we have the Act V leak fight between Pistol and Fluellen in Henry V. Now, in almost all ways, I prefer Branagh's 1989 version to Olivier's from the 40s. It is one of the best Shakespearean film adaptations ever. And it does make sense that the version produced to glorify the English victory at Agincourt to inspire those about to liberate France from the Nazis, but even the 80s version that really tried to play up the war as hell angle in contrast could still have included it. It is, of course, ironic the way parallels were drawn between invading France to liberate it from the Nazis and the far more dubiously righteous cause of liberating it from the Dauphin because of Henry's dubious claim to his throne, but Shakespeare's scenes with four captains from the four separate nationalities that comprise the UK really helps to show the way that wars, even ones that the people of a nation may later conclude were unjust, can have a way of healing racial and ethnic divisions within that nation. In the US, for example, World War II 
played a big part in leading Truman to desegregate the military. And then, when Americans of different races wound up in the same units, putting their lives in each other's hands in Korea and Vietnam, it's not hard to see why these people had a hard time maintaining the same prejudices against each other after they came home. Now, Branagh's version does touch on that a little by including a portion of the what is my nation bit between Flewellen and McMorris in Act 3, but I really would have liked to have seen the resolution that Shakespeare brought this to in Act 5 when Pistol gets his ass kicked by Flewellen and is then told by Gower that it serves him right for thinking he can't fight like a real Englishman because he doesn't speak the language without his funny accent. That scene really drives home that theme about the impact a nation's wars can have on a multicultural populace. And it's a kitten that should have been spared. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the conclusion to another one of the best Shakespearean film adaptations of all time, Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet from 1968. Now, we all know that Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy, We know it most certainly doesn't have a happy ending, but it does have... Roberta Montague, give me thy hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. In the midst of the unspeakable tragedy that's just played out in the two hours traffic of the stage, we do at least see that out of it did come the end of the feud between the Capulets and the Montagues. It's a common misconception that the tragedies are all consistently dark and the comedies are all consistently silly. Shakespeare's tragedies contain numerous funny moments, and his comedies can have some very grim themes, and they are still considered comedies as long as they have happy endings. And while this one little twist that didn't make the final cut in 1968 certainly doesn't make it a happy ending, it certainly mitigates the tragedy, adds balance, and shows an interesting twist in the way that Friar Lawrence's plan to help the two young lovers out of the ulterior motive of thinking that it can bring peace to Verona ultimately does succeed, even at a terrible price. That key twist at the end adds the perfect balance, and it's a kitten that should have been spared. So, what are some of your favorite scenes from Shakespeare, or any play for that matter, that you're disappointed didn't make it into the final cut of a film adaptation? What kittens did you wish they had spared? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to stay tuned for more theater content on this channel. See you soon!